Hi everyone. I'm going to begin today with an apology. They're repaving the street outside of my window, so there's going to be some beeping and some uh, trucks rolling around. I'm sorry about that. But today we're going to be talking about Rococo and how it transitions into neoclassicism. So in other words, the art mostly from France and some from America of the 18th century. Rococo was a style that appeared in France around the year 1700, and it got its name from the French word rocaille, which means pebble, because a lot of the ornamentation of this time period featured pebbles, but also leaves, flowers, and other things from the natural world. Rococo art in general is ornate. It's excessive, it's flowery, it's feminine, it's exuberant, it's full of curves, it often prominently features the color pink, or gold, gold leaf. When looking at Rococo art, keep in mind that at this period in France, 10% of the population held 90% of the whole country's wealth, and the very wealthy were commissioning Rococo artwork. So this is the art of extreme wealth. Rococo interiors in general um, are very, very highly ornamented. You can see that prominent featuring of the gold, just looking at this image, and all of those tiny and very fancy details. Uh, the wealthy at this time period would spend a lot of their time just sitting in rooms like this, entertaining their friends, listening to music, which was also um, very ornate, and eating fancy food. So you can imagine this, this would have been their whole life, and uh, they would have worn luxurious silk gowns that matched this aesthetic. The Rococo aesthetic even um, spread to religious architecture, and when you look at this church and its plan, you can see that the architect went to great lengths to try and remove all straight lines and all corners, so that there's a sense that the whole building is undulating. Uh, the architect and the painters also wanted to create the effect that the whole church was swerving and cur curving upwards towards heaven, as though the very top of it were just about to um, lift off. And there's a real sense of movement and light airiness throughout the whole church. So a lot of the painting that we're going to look at from here on to hmm, maybe two or three modules from now is going to be the product of academic salons either produced by artists that were within the salons or produced as a movement against the art of the academic salon. So what what is an academic salon exactly? Today we would refer to an academic salon um, as a a art show that was produced by students from an art school. Like if you were going to go to RISD's graduate student exhibition, that would be today's equivalent of an academic salon. Uh, so academic salon during the 17th, 18th, and 19th century was the equivalent of an art school, and these art uh, academies or schools would have exhibitions called academic salons and the art that they produced almost exclusively was art for the wealthy and elite and the wealthy would come to the academic salons to the art school shows and they would buy artwork for their homes so it was a kind of uh, self-serving little loop you mostly had to have money in order to become a student at the academic salon and then you were producing artwork for people with money and then they were buying it. Um, we're still kind of living out this legacy today when you think about uh, a lot of art education, but that's another topic. And we'll also be looking at, in a couple modules from now, how artists reacted against academic salons. Watteau is a great example of an artist that was uh, a big hit at the salon and he was very much a product of it. Most of his paintings feature figures like this. This one here is called the indifferent person. Um, this guy is kind of like, he's, he's well dressed, he's very dapper, and he's holding his hands out like, I really don't care, you know. I'm just really wealthy, really well dressed, and I have enough money to live this lifestyle which was very appealing to the kinds of people that would purchase an artwork like this. 
Watteau produced a lot of small sketches. This one here you'll see is 10 inches by 7 inches in preparation for paintings such as Return from Cythera. And Cythera was a uh, imaginary island that was sacred to the goddess of love. And here we're not really sure if the people in this image are returning from it or perhaps they're going to it. It's kind of up in the air. But the whole composition is designed to encourage you to think about the, uh, the escapades of the, the wealthy and um, their personal dramas, which is probably what the wealthy would have sat around and discussed in their very elaborate and very uh, uh, beautiful Rococo uh, uh, parlors. Um, and we see uh, small cupids and like various sort of semi-absurd uh, romantic encounters happening between very well-dressed people. And you can see that everything is very soft and very detailed. All of this is very much uh, indicative of Rococo. Uh, Fragonard is of the same uh, stylistic school. And this here is among his most famous paintings, called The Swing. On the lower left, you can see a portrait of the man who commissioned this painting for his house. And absurdly enough, uh, he is kneeling in some bushes, concealing himself. And he's asked for an unwitting old man to swing the swing where his lover sits. And he has positioned himself so that he can strategically stare up her skirt. This was meant to be humorous and um, very decorative. You can see everything about it is kind of pleasing. It's a humorous story. There's a lot of pink. There are a lot of flowers. There are lots of quote-unquote cute little details, like we've got this sculpture of Cupid that's that's holding his finger up to his lips, like please keep keep it keep this quiet. This is our secret. And we have a dog here who's doing exactly the opposite of that. You can see this tiny little dog here is barking, trying to draw attention to the fact that there is something going on here that is the exact opposite of fidelity, since dogs and paintings uh, often stand for fidelity. So it was meant to be funny. <clears throat> and then the Enlightenment happened. So... To enlighten means to illuminate something, to make it clear. And the Enlightenment, when it's capitalized, is a cultural movement that happened in the 1700s. And the Enlightenment emphasized the use of science and reason to understand the world. The Enlightenment also happened to coincide with the fall of the monarchy in Europe. So during this century, we see a turning away from uh, the power of kings and people uh, rising up in revolution trying to create new forms of government. The Enlightenment follows with that. Enlightenment thinkers in general really hated the Rococo because Rococo style stood for the monarchy and the wealth and the quote-unquote unenlightened. The Enlightenment led eventually to the French Revolution, and we're going to see how that affected artwork. Artwork of the Enlightenment period, or created by artists that supported the Enlightenment, often feature um, reason and uh, rational thought, as opposed to humor, religion, or artwork that glorifies uh, wealth that is connected to the monarchy. This is a great example of an Enlightenment painting. We have a philosopher, and he's giving a lecture at an orrery. An orrery is a small model of the solar system. And during this time period, we see huge advances in the fields of science. Uh, for example, people during this time period had come to accept, in general, that the sun was the center of the solar system. And this is a painting uh, about that. And you can also see that close attention is given to all of the natural details of this scene so that the way that people are illuminated by that center sun is very true to life and it feels very real. Everything is based upon investigation. The Industrial Revolution also happened during this time period and it 
uh, began more or less with the invention of the steam engine in 1740. I've got an image down there on the left. Before the Industrial Revolution, keep in mind that people made most of their things by hand at home. Um, and after the Industrial Revolution, most things were made in factories by, mach by machines. Of course, this changed everyone's lifestyle. Imagine if you had to make everything absolutely from scratch and at home. You would spend a lot of time sewing all of your clothes, pickling all of your food. Now, uh, since people were able to, if they had money, of course, and that's another issue, purchase items, there was theoretically more free time. There was also a creation of a middle class. Uh, so more people were able to have access to art and to higher education than they ever had before. And this led to a new interest in technology as it applied to architecture and to art. Here we have an image of the first ever bridge that was constructed by iron. Uh, uh, Abraham Darby was the designer of this bridge and he used uh, uh, modular segments of iron to create uh, this bridge and he worked with Thomas Pritchard who was an architect and we can see how this kind of building uh, later came to be ad adopted by other artists and architects, most notably the Eiffel Tower, which we'll look at in a little bit. Um, this is just a beautiful example of design being put into practice. We also see the appearance of the natural taste, and artwork that was made in the natural taste depicted scenes of ordinary life, the natural world, and sentimentality as subjects in art. Uh, this movement is also sometimes referred to as naturalism, and it was informed by the philosophy of Rousseau, in contrast to Voltaire, uh, and uh, his interest in the natural as opposed to the artificial. So we have here, this is kind of a movement against Rococo, where Rococo was very highly ornamented. Uh, natural or Naturalism or artwork that was done in the natural taste is far plainer, and uh, takes as its subject the quote-unquote real world. I'm including this image here of an American painting and I, I would also like to just insert a small disclaimer. I particularly kind of dislike American painting because I find it incredibly dull, uh, but other people love it because it is, well, incredibly dull. This here is a portrait of Paul Revere before that incident that made him famous. And you can see that everything within the painting is treated in the same way. So that reflection on the table and the, the reflective surface of his teapot are given just as much attention as his shirt and his face. Uh, I would like to imagine that this was a reflection of the fact that the artist believed that everything in the natural world required the same amount of attention and nothing was necessarily more important one thing than the other. And this also adds to this feeling of the image being kind of downright and plain, uh, all of which was favored by artists that were working in the natural taste. Here is a piece by Chardin, and another disclaimer, I like this piece a lot better, but then again, I, I do kind of prefer elaborate paintings. And this here we have a painting that is more elaborate than the last one, but still done in the natural taste and therefore in some ways quite plain. We see a very normal moment. We have a child who is relatively young, and you can see that just seconds before this moment that's been captured, she was probably making a lot of noise because you've got um, this drum here and this other kind of noise maker on the floor so you can imagine that she was making a racket and then she decides to sit down and say grace and her older sister and her mother are so shocked and pleased that there's this moment of incredible attention and stillness. Uh, this painting is captivating because it's probably something that we've all experienced in one way or the other and everything about it is painted so that it feels very immediate and very real. Remember, all this artwork was done before photography, so something like this would have been um, so so shocking to see an ordinary scene painted uh, in such a relatable way. 
I always try when I can to include artwork by artists who aren't white or aren't men, although the textbook doesn't like to um, include many artists that aren't white men. But here we have two female artists, so we're going to begin by looking at the work of Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun. And um, she actually was part of the academic, uh, of the art academy, briefly before they later decided that women actually couldn't be part of the academy. And she made her living as a painter and painted many royal subjects. She was um, a, a great favorite of the, the queen and the princess. And so she did a lot of portraits like this. Admittedly, her style is rather rococo and, uh, in my eyes, kind of excessively uh, sweet and generalized. I don't feel like any of these are portraits of real people. Um, it all seems kind of like a, uh, well, like a caricature, almost. This is Marie Antoinette. Lebrun was a favorite of Marie Antoinette. Now, the other female artist that we're going to look at from this time period um, uh, was actually not a favorite of Marie Antoinette. Actually, after the French Revolution, um, Adelaide Le Bill Guillard took the opposite side of the um, <clears throat> monarchy. And you can see that her preference was for depicting the natural world and that she would later uh, take the side of the people and not the monarchy. And I think that's reflected in her style. I, I find it interesting how political ideations are often re reflected in artists' work. Because you can see that she pays more attention to the real world, and I feel like um, even just looking at the her picture of the her two pupils in the background, she has a real sense of who they were as people and foregrounds their personality and their importance. This here is an image that was painted uh, during the French Revolution. So the French Revolution began in 1789 with the storming of the Bastille. And the French Revolution is so important because um, it marked the, the long-standing battle of overturning the incredibly powerful monarchy in France. And this was felt throughout all of the Western world. Jacques-Louis David the man who painted this painting came to side with the revolutionaries. And this here is his most famous artwork that was in support of the revolution. It's a portrait of Marat, and Marat was a famous leader of the French Revolution. Marat happened to have a skin condition that kept him in a bath most of the time. And uh, while in the bath, he was murdered by a um, woman who, Charlotte Corday, who was in opposition of the revolution, she came and, and she, she lied about her identity and she stabbed him while he was in his bathtub. Uh, David decided that he needed to make a painting in comm commemoration of Marat. You could think of this almost as a gravestone. On the bottom there it says, To Marat from David. And uh, David painted Marat uh, modeling his pose after Jesus Christ in Michelangelo's Pietà, so you can see a reference in art history to other art history. Let's look at some neoclassicism. Neoclassicism was a style that appeared first in the late 1700s and it was based on classical, meaning ancient Greek and Roman art and architecture. An interest in neoclassicism was fueled by the discovery of Pompeii and Herculaneum, um, but it was also fueled by a moving away from monarchies and people were going back and reading ancient texts about democracy and wanted to revive some of the architecture as well as the political ideas. So neoclassicism did extend um, not only through art and architecture, but also through um, politics and philosophy in the late 1700s. We see it reflected in art. Here's another painting by a woman, and it's a painting of Cornelia. This this is the lady pictured in the center, and uh, the story is that Cornelia was hanging out with her friend, and they were talking about what they found most valuable, and her friend, who was you know shallow, happened to say that she found her jewelry to be the most valuable thing she owned, 
Whereas Cornelia uh, says, you know, actually, I think my kids are the most valuable thing ever. So this is a reflection of the interest now in ancient Greek stories and literature, and also values, and also moving away from the importance of wealth and societal standing, and foregrounding human experience and other people. During this time period, uh, people began to excavate Pompeii. Some of you may have heard of Pompeii. It's an ancient Roman city that, in 79 AD, was covered by a volcanic explosion, and the volcanic explosion sealed it until archaeologists began to excavate it in the late 1700s. Because it was sealed by a volcanic explosion, it was very well preserved. And so people were able to see exactly how houses were designed and decorated during that time period. And they came to copy the styles of design very directly. If you have seen pictures of Pompeii, you'll see that interiors looked much like this. And they designed houses in the almost exact same style as what they were seeing in Pompeii. A lot of artwork that we would associate with um, American government is done in the neoclassical style. This here is George Washington, but Horatio Greeno, who was an American sculptor, decided to sculpt George Washington uh, directly based off of the, the physical att attributes of the god, ancient Greek god Zeus. When he finished this in the 1840s, uh, unfortunately neoclassicism was already sort of out of style and a lot of people hated it because they thought it was uh, a little too Greek because George Washington was topless and wearing a kind of drapey towel thing. And uh, some critics even thre threatened to throw it into the Potomac River, but that never came to pass and you can still see it if you go to Washington DC today if you do find yourself in that area, um, in Virginia to be exact, I recommend that you visit uh, Monticello, which was Thomas Jefferson's actual house. And Thomas Jefferson had designed his house, but then he went to Europe and he saw a lot of ancient Roman and Greek architecture, and he redesigned his house to look like this, to look more like exactly what he saw, because he was so interested in ancient Greek uh, ideas and um, philosophy that he wanted to live in a house that was physically reviving its architecture. And that concludes today's lecture.